Hi everybody, it's time for chapter 20. So in chapter 19, we're having a little trouble between our best buds, Bastion and Atreyu. They're uh, arguing back and forth a little bit because Bastion's lost more of his memories and Atreyu and Falcor are both concerned. They're thinking, we need to get you home soon before you lose all your memories. And Bastion's starting to think, hmm, yeah, you know what? I don't want to go home anymore. I want to stay in Fantasia. Why? Are you trying to get rid of me or something? And they're just uh, arguing back and forth. And now Atreyu and Falcor are even more worried because of Bastion's new plan. He got everybody together and said, you know what? I know what I want to do now. I want to go to the Ivory Tower and see the Childlike Empress because Moonchild owes me and she can tell me what to do. And Atreyu and Falcor both think this is a terrible idea because you can only meet the Childlike Empress once. You cannot see her more than one time. It's just a law of Fantasia that it, that it's impossible. And after, uh, but um, Bastion didn't want to hear any of their advice. He started telling Atrey, you know what? I'm tired of you telling me what to do. You're going to follow me. We're going to the tower and you're going to be quiet and like it. Uh, and on the way, they got met by the this group of just weird, weird creatures. There's this big old crowd of creatures that are just following Bastion around now because they want to see him and meet him and they wonder if maybe he can give them a story of their own like he gave a story to the Silver City. And they were strange. There were just these weird creatures in Fantasia that um, I don't remember all the ones the book uh, told us about. I remember there was a four-quarter troll, the one with the four faces that, uh, that changes every time he has a different feeling. Uh, there was something called a head footer, just a head and some feet, I guess. Uh, a blondie, something called a blondie cat, uh, a gin, um, what else? Oh, there are the puddlers. I really like the puddlers. They're the ones that, um, whenever they move, they turn, they sink down and turn into puddles and then they turn back into themselves when they stop. So if you ever want to do something creative, some creative writing or a, a little bit of artwork, try and make a Fantasian creature. See if you can make one weirder than what the book shows us, because it's the land of stories. There's no limit. So anyway, now they're in this valley. They've set up camp for the night in this valley of gigantic uh, orchids. And so there's something just very unsettling about this valley that, that's just kind of, there. that Bastion and Atreyu and everybody there, they, they don't like the feel of it. It's got some mad spooku buku juju all about it. So. We'll find out more about that in Chapter 20, The Seeing Hand. The dew drops on the orchids glistened in the morning sun as the caravan started out again. The night had been uneventful, except that more and more emissaries kept trailing in. The procession now numbered close to 300. The farther they went into the orchid forest, the stranger grew the shapes and colors of the flowers. And soon, Hickrian, Hisbald, and Hydorn discovered that the fears which had led them to post centuries had not been entirely groundless, for many of the orchids were carnivorous and big enough to swallow a whole calf. True, they could not move of their own volition. It hadn't been really necessary to post centuries. But if something or someone touched them, they snapped shut like traps. And several times, when a blossom seized the hand, foot, or mount of a fellow traveler, the knights were obliged to draw their swords and hack the blossoms to pieces. Throughout the ride, Bastion was besieged by all sorts of fantastic creatures who tried to attract his attention or at least get a look at him. But Bastion rode on in withdrawn silence. A new wish had come to him, and for the first time, it was one that made him seem standoffish and almost sullen. He felt that despite their reconciliation, Atreyu and Falcor were treating him like a child, that they felt responsible for him and thought he had to be led by the nose. But come to think of it, hadn't they been that way from the start? Oh yes, they were friendly enough, but they seemed to feel superior to him. For some reason, to regard him as a harmless innocent who needed protecting, and that didn't suit him at all. He wasn't innocent, he wasn't harmless, and he'd show them. He wanted to be dangerous, dangerous and feared, feared by all, including Atreyu and Falcor. The blue djinn, his name incidentally was Ilwan, elbowed his way through the crush around Bastion, 
crossed his arms over his chest, and bowed. Bastian stopped. What is it, ill one? Speak. My lord, said the djinn in his eagle's voice, I've been consult I've been listening in on the conversations of our new traveling companions. Some of them claim to know this part of the country, and their teeth are chattering with fear. What are they afraid of? This forest of carnivorous orchids, my lord, belongs to Zaida, the wickedest and most powerful sorceress in all Fantasia. She lives in Horok Castle, also known as the Seeing Hand. Tell the scaredy cats not to worry, said Bastion. I'm here to protect them. Ilwan bowed and left him. A little later, Falcor and Atreyu, who had flown far ahead, returned to Bastion. The procession had stopped for the noonday meal. I don't know what to make of it, said Atreyu. Three or four hours' journey from here, in the middle of the orchid forest, we saw a building that looks like a big hand jutting out of the ground. There's something sinister about it, and it's directly in our line of march. Bastion told them what he had heard from Ilwan. If that's the case, said Atreyu, wouldn't it be more sensible to change our direction? No, said Bastion. But there's no reason why we should tangle with this Saida. I think we should steer clear of her. There is a reason, said Bastion. What reason? Because I feel like it, said Bastion. Atreyu looked at him open-mouthed. The conversation stopped, stopped there because Fantasians were crowding in from all sides to get a look at Bastion. But when the meal was over, Atreyu rejoined Bastion, trying to make it sound casual as he suggested, How about taking a ride with Falcor and me? Bastion realized that Atreyu wanted a private talk with him. They hoisted themselves up on Falcor's back, Atreyu in front, Bastion behind him, and the dragon took off. It was the first time the two friends had flown together. Once they were airborne, Atreyu said, It's hard seeing you alone these days, but we have to talk things over, Bastion. Just as I thought, said Bastion with a smile. What's on your mind? Atreyu began hesitantly. Have we come to this place, and are we heading where we are because of some new wish of yours? I imagine so, said Bastion rather coldly. That's what Falcor and I have been thinking, said Atreyu. What kind of wish is it? Bastion made no answer. Don't get me wrong, said Atreyu. It's not that we're afraid of anything or anyone, but we're your friends, and we worry about you. No need to, said Bastion, still more coldly. Falcor twisted his neck and looked back at them. Atreyu, he said, has a sensible suggestion. I advise you to listen to him, Bastion Balthazar Bucks. Some more of your good advice, said Bastion with a sardonic smile. No, Bastion, said Atreyu, no advice, a suggestion. You may not like it at first, but think it over before you turn it down. We want to help you, and we've been wondering how. The whole trouble is the way the childlike empress's amulet affects you. Without Arryn's power, you can't wish yourself ahead. But with Arryn's power, you're losing yourself and forgetting where you want to go. Pretty soon, unless we do something about it, you won't have any idea where you're going. We've already been through that, said Bastion. So what? When I was wearing the gem, said Atreyu, it was entirely different. It guided me, and it didn't take anything away from me. Maybe because I'm not a human, and I have no memory of the human world to lose. In other words, it helped me and did me no harm. So here's what I suggest. Let me have Arryn and trust me to guide you. What do you say? Bastion replied instantly. I say no! Again, Falcor looked back. Couldn't you at least think it over for a moment? No, said Bastion. For the first time, Atreyu grew angry. Bastion, he said, think sensibly. You can't go on like this. Haven't you noticed that you've changed completely? You're not yourself anymore. Thanks, said Bastion. Thank you very much for minding my business all the time. But frankly, I can get along without your advice. In case you've forgotten, I saved Fantasia, and Moonchild entrusted her power to me. She must have had some reason for it, because she could have let you keep Arryn but she took it away from you and gave it to me. I've changed, you say. Yes, my dear Atreyu, you may be right. I'm no longer the harmless innocent you take me for. 
Shall I tell you the real reason why you want me to give up Arin? Because you're just plain jealous. You don't know me yet, but if you go on like this, you'll get to know me. Atreyu did not reply. Falcor's flight had suddenly lost all its buoyancy. He seemed to be dragging himself through the air, sinking lower and lower like a wounded bird. At length, Atreyu spoke with difficulty. Bastion, he said, you can't seriously believe what you've said. Let's forget about it. As far as I'm concerned, you, you never said it. All right, said Bastion, let's forget it. Anyway, I didn't start the argument. For a time, they rode on in silence. In the distance, Horak Castle rose up from the orchid forest. It really did look like a giant hand with five outstretched fingers. But there's something I want to make clear once and for all, said Bastion suddenly. I've made up my mind. I'm not going back at all. I'm going to stay in Fantasia for good. I like it here, so I can manage without my memories. And if it's the future of Fantasia you're worried about, I can give Moonchild thousands of new names. We don't need the human world anymore. Falcor banked for a U-turn. Hey, Bastion shouted. What are you doing? Fly ahead. I want to see Horak up close. I can't, Falcor gasped. I honestly can't go on. On their return to the caravan, they found their traveling companions in a frenzy of agitation. They had been attacked by a band of some 50 giants covered with black armor that made them look like enormous two-legged beetles. Many of the traveling companions had fled and were just beginning to return, singly or in groups. Others had done their best to defend themselves, but had been no match for the armored giants. The three knights, Hickrian, Hisbald, and Hydorn, had fought heroically, but without making a dent in any of their assailants. In the end, they had been disarmed and dragged away in chains. One of the armored giants had shouted in a strangely metallic voice. Zaida, the mistress of Horak Castle, sends greetings to Bastion Balthazar Bucks the savior of Fantasia, and makes the following demands. Submit to me unconditionally, and swear to serve me with body and soul as my faithful slave. Should you refuse, or should you attempt to circumvent my will by guile or stratagem, your three friends, Hickrian, Hisbald, and Hydorn, will die a slow, shameful, and cruel death by torture. You have until sunrise tomorrow to make up your mind. That is the message of Zaida, the mistress of Horak Castle. It has been duly delivered. Bastion bit his lips. Atreyu and Falcor had wiped all expression off their faces, but Bastion knew exactly what they were thinking. What he minded most was their mask of secrecy. But this was hardly the time to have it out with them. That could wait. Instead, he addressed the company in a loud voice. I will never give in to Zaida's blackmail. We must set the prisoners free and without delay. It won't be easy, said, Il said Ilwan, the blue djinn with the eagle beak. All of us together are no match for those black devils. And even if you, my lord, and Atreyu and his luck dragon were to lead us into battle, it would take us too long to capture Horak Castle. The lives of the three knights are in Zaida's hands. She will kill them the moment she finds out that we are attacking. Then we mustn't let her find out, said Bastion. We must take her by surprise. How, how can we do that? Asked the four-quarter troll, putting forward his angry face, which was rather terrifying. Zaida is crafty. I'm sure she has an answer for anything we can think up. I agree, said the prince of the gnomes. There are too many of us. If we move on Horok Castle, she's sure to know it. Even at night, so large a troop movement can't be kept secret. She has her spies. Good, said Bastion. We'll fool her with the help of her spies. How can we do that, my lord? The rest of you will start off in a different direction to make her think we've given up trying to free the prisoners and we're running away. And what will become of the prisoners? I'll attend to that with Atreyu and Falcor. Just the three of you? Yes, said Bastion. That is, if Atreyu and Falcor agree to come with me. If not, I'll go alone. The traveling companions looked at him with admiration. Those closest to him passed his words on to those further back in the crowd. 
My lord, the blue djinn cried out, regardless of whether you conquer or die, this will go down in the history of Fantasia. Bastion turned to Atreyu and Falcor. Are you coming, or have you got some more of your suggestions? We're coming, said Atreyu. In that case, Bastion decreed, the caravan must start moving while it's still light. You must hurry. Make it look as if you were in flight. We'll wait here until dark. We'll join you tomorrow morning, with the three knights or not at all. Go now! After taking a respectful leave of Bastion, the traveling companions started out. Bastion, Atreyu, and Falcor hid in a clump of orchid trees and waited for nightfall. In the late afternoon, a faint jangling was heard, and five of the black giants approached the abandoned camp. They seemed to be all of black metal. Even their faces were like iron masks, and their movements were strangely mechanical. All stopped at once. All looked in the direction where the caravan had gone. Then, without a word, all marched off in step. My plan seems to be working, Bastion whispered. There were only five, said Atreyu. Where are the others? The five are sure to communicate with the rest, said Bastion. At length, it was quite dark. Bastion and Atreyu and Falcor crept from their hiding place, and Falcor rose soundlessly into the air with his two riders. Flying as low as possible over the orchid forest to avoid being seen, he headed in the direction they had taken that afternoon. The darkness was impenetrable and they wondered how they would ever find the castle. But a few minutes later, Horak appeared before them in a blaze of light. There seemed to be a lamp in every one of its thousand windows. Evidently, Zaida wanted her castle to be seen. But that was only reasonable, for she was expecting Bastion's visit. A different sort of visit, to be sure. To be on the safe side, Falcor glided to the ground among the orchids, for his pearly white scales would have reflected the glow of the castle. Under cover of the trees, they approached. Outside the gate, ten of the armored guards were on watch, and at each of the brightly lit windows stood one of them, black, motionless, and menacing. Horak Castle was situated on a rise from which the orchid trees had been cleared. True enough, it was shaped like an enormous hand. Each finger was a tower. The whole building was many stories high, and the windows were like glittering eyes looking out over the countryside. It was known with good reason as the seeing hand. The first thing we do, Bastion whispered into Atreyu's ear, is locate the prisoners. Atreyu nodded and told Bastion to stay there with Falcor. Then he crawled soundlessly away. He was gone a long time. When he returned, he reported, I've been all around the castle. There's only this one entrance and it's too well guarded, but I've discovered a skylight high up at the tip of the middle finger. That, se that seems to be unguarded. Falcor could easily take us up there, but we'd be seen. The prisoners are probably in the cellar. At any rate, I heard a long scream of pain that seemed to come from deep down. Bastion thought hard, then he whispered, I'll try to reach that skylight. Meanwhile, you and Falcor must keep the guards busy. Make them think we're trying to get in by the gate, but don't do any more. Don't get into a fight. Keep them here as long as you can. Give me a few minutes time before you do anything. Atreyu pressed his friend's hand in silence. Then Bastion took off his silver mantle and slipped away through the darkness. He had almost circled the castle when he heard Atreyu shouting, Attention! Bastion Balthazar Bucks, the savior of Fantasia, is here. He has come not to beg Zaida for mercy, but to give her a last chance to release the prisoners. If she sets them free, her miserable life will be spared. Looking around the corner of the castle, Bastion caught a glimpse of Atreyu, who had put on the silver mantle and coiled his blue-black hair into a kind of turban. To anyone who didn't know the two boys very well, there was a certain resemblance between them. For a moment, the armored giant seemed undecided. Then Bastion could hear in the distance the metallic stamping of their feet as they rushed at Atreyu. The shadows in the windows also began to move as the guards left their posts to see what was going on and many more of the armored giants poured out through the gate. When the first had almost reached Atreyu, he slipped nimbly away, and a moment later appeared over their heads, riding Falcor. The armored giants brandished their swords and leapt high in the air, but they couldn't reach him. Bastion started climbing the wall. Here and there he was helped by outcroppings and window ledges, but more often he had to hold fast with his fingertips. Higher and higher he climbed. 
Once, the jutting stone he had set his foot on crumbled away and left him hanging by one hand. But he pulled himself up, found a hold for his other hand, and kept climbing. When at last he reached the towers, he made better progress, for they were so close together that he could push himself up by bracing himself between them. At length, he reached the skylight and slipped through. True enough, there was no guard in the tower room. Heaven knows why. Opening a door, he came to a narrow, winding staircase and started down. When he reached the floor below, he saw two black guards standing at a window watching the excitement outside. He managed to pass behind them without attracting their notice. On he crept down more stairways, through passages and corridors. One thing was certain. These armored giants might have been great fighters, but they didn't amount to much as guards. At last, the cold and the musty smell told him he was in the cellar. Luckily, all the guards seemed to have raced upstairs in pursuit of the supposed Bastion Balthazar Bucks. Torches along the walls lit the way for him. Lower and lower he went. He had the impression that there were as many floors below the ground as above. Finally, he came to the bottommost cellar and soon found the dungeon where Hickrian, Hisbald, and Hydorn were languishing. It was a pitiful sight. They were hanging by their wrists over what seemed to be a bottomless pit. The long iron chains that held them were connected by way of overhead rollers with a winch, but the winch was fastened with a great padlock and couldn't be budged. Bastion stood perplexed. The three prisoners' eyes were closed. They seemed to be asleep or unconscious. Then Hydorn the Enduring opened his left eye and sang out, Hey, friends, look who's here! The others managed to open their eyes, and a smile crossed their lips. We knew you wouldn't leave us in the lurch, cried Hydorn. How can I get you down, Bastion asked. The winch is locked. Just take your sword and cut the chain, said Hisbald. And drop us in the pit, said Hickrian. That's not such a good idea. Anyway, said Bastion, I can't draw my sword. I can't use Seconda unless it jumps into my hand. That's the trouble with magic swords, said Hydorn. When you need them, they go on strike. Hey, Hisbald whispered, the guards had the key to that winch. Where could they have put it? I remember a loose stone, said Hickrian, but I couldn't see very well while they were hoisting me up here. Bastion looked and looked. The light was dim and flickering, but after a while he discovered a stone flag that was not quite even with the rest. He lifted it cautiously, and there indeed was the key. He opened the big padlock and removed it from the winch. Then slowly he began to turn. It creaked and groaned so loud that the armored giants must have heard it by then if they weren't totally deaf. Even so, there was nothing to be gained by stopping. Bastion went on turning until the three knights were level with the floor, though still over the pit. Then, after swinging them to and fro until their feet touched the ground, he let them down. They stretched out exhausted and showed no inclination to move. Besides, they still had the heavy chains on their wrists. Bastion had little time to think, for metallic steps came clanking down the stone stairs. The guards! The armor glittered in the torchlight, like the carapaces of giant insects. All with the same movement, they drew their swords and rushed at Bastion. Then, at last, Seconda leapt from the rusty sheath and into his hand. With the speed of lightning, the blade attacked the first of the armored giants and hacked him to pieces before Bastion himself knew what was happening. It was then that he saw what the giants were made of. They were hollow shells of armor. There was nothing inside. He had no time to wonder what made them move. Bastion was in a good position, for only one giant at a time could squeeze through the narrow doorway of the dungeon. And one at a time, Seconda chopped them to bits. Soon, the remains lay piled up on the floor like enormous black eggshells. After some twenty of them had been disposed of, the rest withdrew, evidently in the hope of waylaying Bastion in a position more favorable to themselves. Taking advantage of the breathing spell, Bastion let Seconda cut the shackles from the knight's wrists. Hickrian and Hydorn dragged themselves to their feet and tried to draw their swords, which, strangely enough, had not been taken away, had not been taken away from them, but their hands were numb from the long hanging and refused to obey them. His bald, the most delicate of the three, wasn't even able to stand up by himself. His two friends had to hold him up. 
Never mind, said Bastion. Seconda needs no help. Just stay behind me and don't get in my way. They left the dungeon, slowly climbed the stairs, and came to a large hall. Suddenly, all the torches went out, but Seconda shone bright. Again, they heard the heavy metallic tread of many armored giants. Quick, cried Bastion, back to the stairs. This is where I'm going to fight. He couldn't see whether the three knights obeyed his order, and there was no time to find out, because Seconda was already dancing in his hand. The entire hall was ablaze with its sharp white light. The assailants managed to push Bastion back from the top of the stairs and to attack him from all sides. Yet not one of their mighty blows touched him. Seconda whirled around him so fast that it looked like hundreds of swords, and a few moments later he was surrounded by a heap of shattered black armor in which nothing stirred. Come on up, Bastion cried to his companions. The three knights stood gaping on the stairs. Hickrian's mustache was trembling. I've never seen anything like it, he cried. Something to tell my grandchildren, Hisbald stammered. The only trouble, said Hydorn mournfully, is that they won't believe you. Bastion stood there with sword in hand, wondering what to do next. Suddenly, it sprang back into its sheath. The danger seems to be over, he said. At least the part that calls for a sword, said Hydorn. What do we do now? Now, said Bastion, I want to make this Zaida's acquaintance. I've got a bone to pick with her. After climbing several more flights of stairs, Bastion and the knights reached the ground floor, where Atreyu and Falcor were waiting for them in a kind of lobby. Well done, you two, cried Bastion, slapping Atreyu on the back. What's become of the armored giants, asked Atreyu. Hollow shells, said Bastion contemptu contemptuously. Where's Zaida? Up in her magic throne room, answered Atreyu. Come along, said Bastion, taking the silver mantle, which Atreyu held out to him. And all together, including Falcor, they climbed the broad stairway leading to the upper floors. When Bastion, followed by his companions, entered the magic throne room, Zaida arose from her red coral throne. She was wearing a long gown of violet silk, and her flaming red hair was coiled and braided into a fantastic edifice. Her face and her long, thin hands were as pale as marble. There was something strangely disturbing about her eyes. It took Bastion a few moments to figure out what it was. They were of different colors, one green, one red. She was trembling, evidently in fear of Bastion. He looked her straight in the face and she lowered her long lashes. The room was full of weird objects whose purpose it was hard to determine. There were large globes covered with designs, side reel clocks and pendulums hanging from the ceiling. There were costly censers from which, from which rose heavy clouds of different colored smoke, which crept over the floor like fog. Thus far, Bastion hadn't said a word. That seemed to shatter Zaida's composure, for suddenly she threw herself on the floor in front of him, took one of his feet, and set it on her neck. My lord and master, she said in a deep voice that sounded somehow mysterious. No one in Fantasia can withstand you. You are mightier than the mighty and more dangerous than all the demons together. If you wish to take revenge on me for being too stupid to recognize your greatness, trample me underfoot. I have earned your anger. But if you wish once again to demonstrate your far-famed magnanimity, suffer me to become your obedient slave who swears to obey you body and soul. Teach me to do what you deem desirable, and I will be your humble pupil, obedient to your every hint. I repent of the harm I tried to do you, and beg your mercy. Arise, Zaida, said Bastion. He had been very angry, but her speech pleased him. If she had really acted out of ignorance and really regretted it so bitterly, then it was beneath his dignity to punish her. And since she even wished to learn what he deemed desirable... He could see no reason to reject her plea. Zaida arose and stood before him with bowed head. Will you obey me unconditionally, he asked, however hard you may find it to do my bidding? Will you obey me without argument and without grumbling? I will, my lord and master, said Zaida. You will see there is nothing we cannot accomplish if we combine my artifices and your power. Very well, said Bastion. Then I will take you into my service. 
You will leave this castle and go with me to the ivory tower, where I am expecting to meet Moonchild. For a fraction of a second, Zaida's eyes glowed red and green. But then, veiling them with her long lashes, she said, I am yours to command, my lord and master. Thereupon, all descended the stairs. Once outside the castle, Bastion observed, The first thing to do is find our traveling companions. Goodness knows where they are. Not very far from here, said Zaida. I've led them slightly astray. For the last time, said Bastion. For the last time, she agreed. But how will we get there? Do you expect me to walk through the woods and at night? Falcor will carry us, said Bastion. He's strong enough to carry us all. Falcor raised his head and looked at Bastion. His ruby red eyes glittered. I'm strong enough, Bastion Balthazar Bucks, boomed the bronze bell-like voice, but I will not carry that woman. Oh, yes, you will, said Bastion, because I command it. The luck dragon looked at Atreyu, who nodded almost imperceptibly, but Bastion had seen that nod. All took their places on Falcor's back, and he rose into the air. Which way? he asked. Straight ahead, said Zaida. Which way? Falcor asked again, as if he hadn't heard her. Straight ahead, Bastion shouted. You heard her. Do as she says, said Atreyu under his breath, and Falcor complied. Half an hour later, already the dawn was graying, they saw innumerable campfires down below, and the luck dragon landed. In the meantime, many more Fantasians had turned up, and a lot of them had brought tents. The camp spread out on a wide, flower-strewn meadow at the edge of the orchid forest. Looked like a tent city. How many are you now? Bastion asked. Ilwan, the blue djinn who had taken charge of the caravan in Bastion's absence, replied that he had not yet been able to make an exact count, but that he guessed there were close to a thousand. And there's something else to report, he added. Something rather strange. Soon after we pitched camp, shortly before midnight, Five of those armored giants that five of those armored giants appeared. But they were peaceful, and they've kept to themselves. Of course no one dared to go near them. They brought a big litter made of red coral, but it was empty. Those are my carriers, said Zaida in a pleading tone to Bastion. I sent them ahead last night. That's the pleasantest way to travel, if it does not displease you, my lord. I don't like the look of this, Atreyu interrupted. Why not, said Bastion. What's your objection? She can travel any way she likes, said Atreyu dryly. But she wouldn't have sent her litter here last night if she hadn't known in advance that she'd be coming here. She had planned the whole thing. Your victory was really a defeat. She purposely let you win. That was her way of winning you over. Enough of this, cried Bastion, purple with anger. I didn't ask for your opinion. You make me sick with your lecturing. And now you question my victory and ridicule my magnanimity? Atreyu was going to say something, but Bastion screamed at him. Shut up and leave me be! If the two of you aren't satisfied with what I do and the way I am, go away. I'm not keeping you. Go where you please. I am sick of you. Bastion folded his arms over his chest and turned his back on Atreyu. The Fantasians who had gathered around were dumbfounded. For a time, Atreyu stood silent. Up until then... Bastion had never reprimanded him in the presence of others. He was so stunned he could hardly breathe. He waited a while, then, when Bastion did not turn back to him, he slowly walked away. Falcor followed him. Zaida smiled. It wasn't a pleasant smile. In that moment, Bastion's memory of having been a child in his world was effaced. Okay, see you guys in chapter 21.